Okay, this meeting is being recorded and live streaming on YouTube. Alderman, you may begin. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the One Central Community Meeting webinar. My name is Pat Dowell. I'm your third ward alderman, and I want to thank all of you for showing up this evening. Um, the South Loop is a very active uh, community, and I appreciate all of you taking the time out of your schedule to attend this important meeting. Um, with us this evening, there are several elected officials. Um, Alderman Sophia King from the fourth ward, who has a portion of the One Central uh, proposal in her ward. State Representative Cam Buckner, Senator Robert Peters, and Senator Maddie Hunter. All of us are here this evening to listen to the One Central development proposal, answer your questions, and get your feedback. As your alderman, I have been transparent regarding this proposal. When the development team led by Bob Dunn first showed up at my office in early 2019, I presented to the South Loop community on two occasions, one in March 2019 and one in July 2019. During both of these meetings, concerns were raised regarding density, views, Twain Park, traffic and safety, security, property values, among other things. I made the decision then not to hold more meetings until Landmark was ready to move from a concept to a proposal because the proposal requires a formal review by the Department of Planning and Development. We are at the very beginning of that review process. I want to assure you of the following. One, this project is not a done deal. Two, there are no backroom shenanigans going on. And three, as your alderman, I am committed to a transparent process and a fair discussion of the merits of this proposal. So let's get on with the meeting. Cindy? Thank you, Alderman Dell, uh, and welcome everyone, community residents and the public who've joined this virtual webinar tonight. My name is Cindy Chen Rubick and I'm an assistant commissioner and I lead the central planning region for the Department of Planning and Development. The department has set up a webpage, www.chicago.gov slash one central, where we have this presentation deck for tonight's webinar uploaded, as well as a link to DPD's YouTube page for the live streaming of the meeting. And this link has also been shared with the Alderman's Facebook page as well. We had over 500 participants register for this webinar and it is being recorded. Um, and of the registrants, about 285 people live in the near South community area, about 270 people work there, and almost everyone who registered visits this area often or occasionally. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of the agenda for tonight's webinar, I'll introduce the city staff on the panel today, and I'll highlight the information presented by DPD at the last community meeting for this project, which was in July of 2019. Then I'll explain the status of review for the One Central proposal, and the developer will then present their proposal and ongoing analysis, and then we will have a Q&A portion at the, for the rest of the meeting. For the questions, we will start with the questions we received in advance of today's meeting. And then we will answer the questions we receive in the Q&A box uh, of this meeting format. If you are streaming on YouTube, you can also submit your questions uh, on YouTube as we are, we are monitoring those questions as well. We will do our best to answer all of the questions during the webinar. Moderating the Q&A with me tonight is Emily Thrun, who is the DPD project manager for this project. And with us tonight are other city staff from the Departments of Planning and Development, Transportation and Law. We have Noah Zafraniak, Kevin Bargnes, um, Jeff Shriver, Bill Higgins, Karen Wagulia, and Michael Gaynor. Um, next slide, please. 
So uh, in the July 2019 meeting, which was held obviously in person pre-COVID, um, we did give an update on the status of the one central proposal. We explained most of the meeting was for our uh, the department to explain the existing development rights remaining in the existing PDs that are here overlapping the one central proposal. Those PDs are PD331, PD stands for plan development, 499 and 833. And we summarized um, each of those PDs, as well as the combined floor area remaining of those planned development projects, which is about 4.7 million square feet. Residential units remaining as part of the, those projects are about just over 2,000 units. And then there's over 3 million of office space remaining, uh, about 570,000 commercial space remaining about 2 million square feet of exhibit space remaining. And then the parking requirements were identified, it depended on the uses. Uh, and then we went through a series of slides about the impacts and some questions that were uh, still outstanding related to the project. Um, and this, the entire community deck is available um, for your reference uh, on the DPD page for the One Central project. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, over the last um, year or so, we have been um, developing this master plan development review process for these large uh, projects. And um, just so you, everyone is aware of where we are on this project, the One Central project, we did have an intake meeting, which is an informal meeting with the development team and the impacted city departments. Uh, that was held in November, at the end of November. And the next step in that process is a pre-application community meeting. And that's why we have hosted this meeting with the aldermen. So really we wanna make sure that the community is up to date on the information that we have um, and that we get input and feedback you know, early in the process. Um, and then of course, after that, we will need to have some more regular meetings with the applicant. The applicant also has the ability to file their plan development application. As long as they have a complete application, they are allowed to file. Um, and then of course, uh, as with all filing of applications, the city then reviews the application. And then we have follow-up community meeting, uh, assuming there will be updates and more information provided uh, through the application process at that time. Um, and, and that process can last a while. We don't have a specific timeline for that. It really depends on the complexity of the project. And this is a, a complex project. So we do expect all of this to take um, some time. Um, but then after that, uh, if we get a complete submission for the Chicago Plan Commission hearing, then we um, can place it on the agenda. Um, and we have that plan commission hearing. Uh, and then after that is the city council process, the committee on zoning, landmarks and building standards and city council vote. Next slide, please. So the planning and zoning impacts and analysis, um, the applicant is requesting to build up to 22,300,000 uh, square feet thousand and a total FAR of 16.42. And, and um, you know, the department is reviewing their request. We've not made any decisions. And the criteria for the city's review includes the following, whether or not the proposed development complies with the plan development standards and guidelines as outlined in the municipal code, whether the development is compatible with the character of the surrounding area in terms of uses, density, and building scale, whether the public infrastructure facilities and city services will be adequate to serve the proposed development at the time of occupancy, and whether the proposal meets the lakefront protection ordinance criteria. Next slide, please. The developer's proposal also includes a new transit hub as part of what they're calling the civic build with connections for Amtrak, Metra, and CTA, both elevated trains and buses. So the city's review will include the following, whether it's feasible, whether the proposed transit and transportation connections are feasible, both physically and operationally. And we also wanna better understand the community and traffic impacts of the proposed infrastructure improvements. And we want to also understand whether the proposed vehicular access points are feasible and sufficient to accommodate the level of development rights proposed and whether or not the necessary service and emergency access requirements of the site are also provided. Next slide. 
So I'm gonna hand it over to the Landmark Development Team and they'll continue presenting their updates. Thank you, Cindy. I want to uh, just begin by thanking Alderman Dowell, Alderman King, um, City DPD staff who we've been working closely with now for several months to begin the process of moving the project, moving One Central from, as Alderman Dowell described, a concept to a formal proposal with the city. We're not yet at the point of uh, bringing the project to the city as a formal proposal, but as we continue on from this evening, uh, that is the direction that we will be heading and we will have a formal proposal uh, to the city at the appropriate point in time. Uh, we've prepared a series of slides tonight to provide an update of really where our efforts have been focused uh, from the last uh, major community meetings that we had in mid-2019. Uh, we've used our time uh, from then until now uh, to engage a whole series of different uh, interest from within the community. Certainly the, the South Loop neighborhood has been one of those uh, primary areas that we focused on. We've also had a great amount of inf input from other stakeholders, the civic and cultural institutions, interests on the South side, the business community, uh, and other civic and uh, governmental interests throughout the metro area. So much of our time uh, in this period from mid-2019 to where we are today has been focused on gathering input, learning from that input, and beginning to shape a more formal plan that we'll be bringing to the city. Uh, as part of our presentation this evening, uh, I've asked Jim Reynolds from Loop Capital to join us. Uh, Jim is a participant on our finance team. Jim is also a resident of the South Loop neighborhood uh, and very active in a variety of different community interests. And Jim will uh, assist me in making the presentation this evening. Along with Jim Reynolds, uh, I've asked Andre Brumfield with the Gensler uh, design firm to join us. Gensler has been our lead uh, architectural master planning and engineering firm. Uh, Andre has been intimately involved in the project now for a couple of years, and he'll assist me in explaining uh, the general approach to land use and master plan for One Central. Next slide. Uh, just as background and context, uh, there are many different factors that influence One Central. We think there are really four primary factors that make this project distinct and unique uh, in Chicago and, and in many respects unique nationally. Number one is the transit uh, improvements that are uh, able to be brought together in a multimodal transit hub at this site. And, and we'll talk about this as we go through the presentation. The second, which is really identified on the map here, uh, is the presence of the civic and cultural institutions that surround the site. Uh, those two factors really make this uh, one of the most interesting and unique development sites that we've seen, uh, certainly in Chicago and around the country. Uh, you bring nearly 50 million visitors a year into the lakefront district of the city. Uh, and those visitors are coming primarily uh, to access the civic and cultural institutions that are identified in the slide. The third factor that I would point to, and we'll talk about this uh, further into the presentation, is what this project can mean really as a gateway to the south side. I think now more than ever, and, and I know Jim will, will uh, share these comments uh, from his perspective, but now more than ever, we think a catalytic project like One Central really can be a fundamental part of helping to bring economic opportunity to the south side. And it's really the transit connections at One Central that make that possible. And the fourth point that we'll touch on briefly this evening is the technology that's available at this site uh, is unique at this location and really is one of the things that's going to shape the urban landscape, not just in Chicago, but elsewhere around the country as we look forward over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, and an extremely valuable asset in really uh, building up the urban strength and core of downtown Chicago. Next slide. Uh, we'll talk uh, quite a bit about the, the boundaries of the site. Uh, I think this map does a good job of framing uh, the overall boundaries. There's 
just more than 30 acres of land and air rights that make up the one central site. Uh, the boundaries to the west are the CN Track and Indiana Avenue to the north, uh, McFetridge to the east, Lakeshore Drive, and to the south, McCormick Place, the North Hall of McCormick Place. I know in our some of our prior discussions, uh, there were questions about how far to the north the property extends. Uh, it does not extend beyond 14th Street and McFetridge. There's an area there up to Roosevelt Road uh, that previously was part of the footprint of this site, uh, but that land is uh, under the control of the city today, or I should say the air rights over the Metro track between the northern boundary of our site up to Roosevelt Road are no longer a part of this site. Next slide. Uh, in general context, uh, as Cindy had described, what we refer to as the civic build, uh, phase one, if you will, of One Central is a $3.8 billion uh, infrastructure improvement uh, that provides several elements of infrastructure as part of this initial phase of development. Number one is the transit hub with the potential to link together Metra and NICTI rail lines that, that come through the site today. Uh, secondly, in our transit feasibility study, we've been evaluating the potential for a CTA extension to the site. Uh, that extension would occur in the CN right-of-way uh, coming from west to east elevated. Uh, what service lines would be brought to the site has not yet been determined. That's a, an ongoing discussion with CTA. In addition, there's potential for Amtrak service to connect to the transit hub. And then a service line that we call Shyline, uh, which we've talked about in our public meetings before, which would be a tram-like system that would connect from the transit hub at one central to the civic and cultural institutions along the lakefront. Along with that infrastructure, we propose an urban entertainment district uh, that would provide retail dining entertainment unique to this site. Uh, there are four core components of that district centered on entertainment lifestyle, experiential attractions, and neighborhood retail. And then the balance of the civic build would include uh, a modest amount of mid-rise residential and something in the neighborhood of 3,500 structured parking stalls. Uh, the civic build then uh, creates the footprint and the infrastructure that's needed to support vertical development. Uh, this is a massing study of what the vertical development would represent to meet the 22 million plus square feet that Alderman Dahl referenced in her opening remarks. That program would be built out over a roughly 20 year period of time and is about an equal mix of commercial mixed use and residential. There will also be hospitality and the welcome center that's a part of the transit hub. Uh, that's what makes up the more than 22 million square feet as proposed in this diagram. Uh, there's a series of subjects that we'll speak to throughout the presentation this evening. We wanted to start with a discussion uh, which relates to the state legislation. Uh, I did see some media today that uh, I, I don't think uh, presented this in a totally accurate manner. So Jim Reynolds and I will walk you through the mechanics of the state legislation. Point number one is this is not a TIF. This bears no resemblance to TIF. Uh, and there is not city financing that is being sought for this development. Uh, the civic build is a $3.8 billion privately financed public-private partnership that is established uh, in legislation with the state of Illinois under what's called the Build Illinois Infrastructure Financing Program. Uh, the primary distinction to TIF with the Civic Build is while it's 100% privately financed, that is an asset that is acquired by the state over a 20-year period of time. That's what the state legislation provides for, is a series of what are called state equity payments uh, that do not start until the civic build is complete. So the state makes no investment until that asset is complete and operational. Those payments uh, start at 200 million and grow over time to $400 million plus by the last year of the payment schedule. Uh, that totals over time, uh, total payments by the state of 6.5 billion. And what's also unique about the legislation and the structure of 
the civic build financing. And really when I say this bears no resemblance to TIF, this is the primary distinction. Uh, we on the private side are contributing uh, $5 billion toward that public asset over that same 20 year period of time. And so the question I'm asked oftentimes is, if the state's funding 6.5 billion and the private sector's funding 5 billion and the asset costs $3.8 billion to build, what's the difference in that, uh, in that formula? And the easiest way I can explain it is no different than any of us who have purchased a home over time. Uh, if you buy a home for say $400,000 and you pay for it over 20 years, you amortize off that debt, your payments on that $400,000 home over a 20 year period would add up to something in the neighborhood of a, a million one, a million two uh, in total payments over 20 years. In addition to that, you have operating costs, property taxes, insurance, utilities, maintenance, upkeep. Uh, when you add all of that together, a $400,000 home over 20 years ends up costing uh, much more than what you pay for it. And that's the structure that we have here. And again, what's unique here is the private sector is contributing to build and operate a public asset and contributing those dollars over 20 years. After 20 years, the state takes ownership of that asset and the economics that come with ownership of that asset. So those are some of the primary uh, uh, points that are framed in the legislation. The, the other key point that I would touch on, and I'll ask Jim then to comment, is really the driving uh, force behind this legislation is it marries a public-private partnership to build infrastructure. We'll talk about the importance of the transit infrastructure later, but it uses the private sector financing tools to build critical transit infrastructure that benefits the entire metro area. And it marries that transaction, that infrastructure financing together with a major economic development initiative. In this case, over time, we'll invest nearly $20 billion of private capital to build upwards of 20 million square feet of uh, privately owned real estate. We'll generate 19,000 construction jobs immediately. And over that, uh, 30 plus year period of time, the economic benefit, in other words, the new tax dollars generated by the state, the city and the county total over $151 billion of new taxes to the state, the county and city. And you see at the bottom of the page, the breakdown of those new taxes, $77 billion of net new taxes to the state, nearly $60 billion of net new taxes to the city. And Jim, uh, maybe you can you can speak more directly to the importance of this kind of public-private partnership married with an economic development, uh, particularly in light of the economic realities that we're all facing right now. Thanks, Bob. And uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Alderman Dow, Alderman King, and a pleasure to be a, a part of this unique team on this uh, very, very impactful project. Uh, one thing that I've been very consistent in saying over the last few years, it's certainly been highlighted uh, with the impact that COVID has had on the city's finances, the county's finances, and the state's finances, that we need large, impactful, scalable uh, development uh, to really move us forward in terms of generating substantial revenue for the city and state. Uh, it's been uh, very difficult to continue to tax at the state level, at the city level. Obviously, we saw one of the tax proposals for the governor, uh, a graduated income tax did not pass, which would have been uh, certainly anticipated for significant revenue. And the mayor uh, barely got a um, property tax. Well, she got a property tax increase through. The, the part of the equation that I like to focus on and I think we all need to focus on is how we can have impactful economic development to generate new revenues to the city and state. Particularly that development that involves private money going into public asset and the public keeping that asset. As Bob pointed out, after 20 years, the state owns this transit hub, which will cash flow to infinity. 
unlike uh, something like a park and meter deals that are just gone, private. Um, when you also look at a development like this, from my perspective, I like to think about the economic impact both on the tax rolls, and as Bob pointed out, the state will receive $77 billion in new taxes, the city $59 billion in new tax revenues, and the county $14 billion in new tax revenues. I also like to look at these, uh, these uh, projects of this type, which they're very few. I don't know if there's five in the entire state of this magnitude from the perspective of what will be the economic impact uh, to the city, to the people, particularly to the folks on the South and West side who desperately need more economic engines. A big part of this proposal, as Bob pointed out, are 14,000 construction jobs, but you know, construction's gonna be over, probably 7,000 permanent jobs, transformational impact on minority and women-owned businesses that will be involved in building this $3.8 billion civic build. Every, everything from our construction companies, our technology companies, our engineering companies, our financial institutions, our law firms, you name it, are going to be working on this project. But even more, even as impactful as that is what's going to happen with a lot of the residents on the south side and west side, but particularly the south side, as this transit hub, this transit facility will travel through the south side. The commitment to 70,000 permanent jobs, a substantial commitment to uh, apprenticeship programs, internship programs, and business ownership of many of the shops uh, and stores and, and aspects of commercial that will be a part of this project. So when you stop and you think about, okay, what is the impact of, of those sorts of things in combination to life changing sort of circumstances to our young people that'll come down there to, to folks that will learn new skills that will come off of the societal roles, the social services roles, be in the tax generating roles, you start to put together a financial impact in the multiple, multiple, multiple billions of dollars. But everything can't just be measured in the billions of dollars, which is kind of the world I live in. When we think about the commitment that has been made to this project, to taking young people and training them to these types of jobs, high skilled jobs in the apprenticeship programs, learning how to run some of the businesses that'll be a part of this project, then you're into economic impacts, well over 100, $150 billion of, um, of economic impact to folks in and around that. You can't tax your way out of many of the situations that we're seeing right now, it just won't work. And businesses and projects that create 50 jobs or 100 jobs may sound significant in the neighborhood that they're in, but I think we all know that won't move our financial needle. We need substantial projects that create thousands of jobs, have billions of dollars of financial impact and change the trajectory of minority owned businesses as this will and lives of folks that live on the South and West side. So I'm very excited to be a part of this project for those reasons. Bob, I'll flip it back over to you. Thank you, Jim. I, you know, I think you really kind of captured the essence of the fact that this is an investment. This is not a public contribution into a private asset. And that's really what distinguishes this from something like TIF. If this were a TIF financing, that $6.5 billion, if it were TIF of city money, would go into an asset to be owned by the developer. That's not the case here. This is an asset to be owned by the state. If this were TIF for 23 years, the city's property taxes would be going to make those payments in this case to fund the $6.5 billion of city money that would come into the project to be owned by the developer. In this case, property taxes generated day one are realized by the city. And the last point before we move on that I wanna emphasize and we'll come back to is this is a four-year infrastructure build. 
Uh, this country is focused heavily right now on finding opportunities for major infrastructure investment. We generate 19,000 construction jobs, leading to 70,000 permanent jobs on site. Uh, there are a few projects anywhere in the country that can create this kind of economic impact and return to the state, the county, and the city. So next slide. Jim, you spoke in, in great detail about what this project can mean to the south side. I won't go through this slide in great detail, other than to say uh, in our legislation, we authored a program called South Side Works. AECOM has completed a economic base analysis for us, the purpose of which is to measure how can one central help to lead to transformative positive economic opportunity for the South Side. And what's represented here is the transit hub creates a connection between Metra, CTA, and other rail and bus service lines that opens up access for 100,000 residents today on the south side to get access to jobs in a 30 minute commute, a normal commuting pattern. Whereas today, those commuting times can be an hour and a half or more twice a day. South side works is very much a, a fundamental part of uh, what we are advancing in our formal proposal that will come to the city. And in many respects, we can believe this can be the catalyst to help support the city's Invest Southwest initiative as we start to move forward. And what's critical here is this is really a program uh, to facilitate opportunity both during construction as well as during operations when we grow to that point of 70,000 jobs on site. Next slide. Uh, as we look back over the last year and a half, uh, we'll talk quite a bit about the work that's been done to begin to shape the formal proposal for the city. But going back in time, Alderman Dowell mentioned uh, the public town hall meetings that we hosted at McCormick Place. The city hosted a meeting, DPD hosted a meeting July 15th of 2019. After that, from mid 2019 until early 2020, we hosted a, a range of different meetings uh, with different interests within the community, within the neighborhood, uh, the civic interests, as I mentioned, south side interest. And we gathered a, a tremendous amount of information in going through that process. And we fully intend to continue this process. Next slide. Uh, the type of uh, issues that we learned in our meetings with the neighborhood are outlined on this slide. I won't go through all of these, but uh, many issues like density, scale, uh, size of buildings, uh, parks and open space, traffic impacts. Uh, as we learned what the interests were, are within the community, we've since undertaken a tremendous amount of effort and work to put together uh, detailed analysis, uh, a full transit feasibility study, and a series of other uh, studies that I'll mention a little further into the presentation. Uh, which is this slide. Uh, we've completed a full transit feasibility study. That study has been developed uh, to the federal standards. What's called the STOPS model uh, is not a subjective. Uh, we put the analytics in and, and the model tells us what we want the model to tell us. This is a federal model that is used by all regional transit agencies throughout the country, where you look at opportunities to create connectivity uh, with rail and it begins to uh, provide the outputs as to what an opportunity like this can mean in terms of better serving the entire metro area uh, with this type of transit hub. We've completed market demand and feasibility studies. We've updated our fiscal and economic impact analysis. And as I said, we've done a complete uh, econo economic base analysis to understand how this project can lead to positive outcomes on the south side. We've also undertaken land use uh, ongoing community engagement. And as Andre will talk about, uh, we've done detailed planning and evolved our master plan, uh, which is really the basis of our intake filing. The infrastructure, uh, the transit, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the proposal here is to uh, utilize existing infrastructure primarily with the exception of uh, the CTA extension from the West in the CN corridor. I wanna stress uh, 
These are all ideas that are being studied. We're working closely with each of the transit agencies. Uh, no final decisions have been made with respect to what service lines with CTA or the exact uh, design engineering criteria around uh, really any of the transit improvements, although a lot of work is underway as we speak to work through the engineering, the operations issues and what have you. Uh, the slide on the left shows the proposed improvements that would allow for Metra, CTA, the Shy Line, and Amtrak, all to be serviced through the transit hub uh, that will be located uh, really at the center point of One Central. Uh, this gives you a more three-dimensional uh, sense of how that CTA extension would come in from the west, running above the existing CN right-of-way, uh, and how it would then tie into the transit hub. Uh, this is unlike any type of transit improvement in the metro area today. Uh, it's a fully enclosed, secured, vertically integrated transit station. Uh, it does not allow for uh, a transit patron to get off on a platform, walk down a city stair or down a transit stair into city streets. All circulation is internally organized and will come in through the transit hub uh, and as I said, that's a vertically integrated zone, highly secure uh, and enclosed, like I said, unlike any transit uh, improvement that I could identify in Metro Chicago. Uh, the Shy Line, uh, as I said, is a proposed uh, transit system that would run on the existing uh, CTA busway, running from McCormick Place to the transit hub at One Central, up through the park, uh, potentially serving areas north of the river, Navy Pier, Streeterville, Michigan Avenue, and then would circulate back. Uh, this study continues to evolve. Uh, we've seen great potential uh, to generate ridership to support the entire lakefront district. It kind of builds on the theories of the central area circulator that was studied many years ago. Uh, and the critical part of this is linking to the transit hub at One Central. Uh, it would be served with this type of vehicle. Uh, there's a number of different vehicle types that can provide efficient uh, transportation running on this type of a uh, wheeled vehicle uh, that provides efficiency uh, throughout the entire lakefront district and an ability to, to serve that area with high frequency. Uh, we've had many questions that relate to vehicular uh, and pedestrian access to the site. I'll touch on these quickly. Uh, one of the issues from our early meetings with Alderman Dowell that we focused on is uh, not providing vehicular access from the west through the neighborhood. Uh, the focus has been serving one central in terms of uh, vehicular traffic uh, coming into the site at 18th Street, uh, which is a full diamond inter interchange as we've learned in our transit feasibility study uh, has significant capacity. That's really an improvement built for game day. So it has a uh, tremendous capacity, 365 days a year. There will be a new ingress egress point at McFetridge to the north uh, and service access proposed to come in below McCormick Place on Moen Mines Drive, then connecting to uh, service drives that will serve the site uh, really at the grade level of the civic build, uh, not on city streets. The pedestrian access uh, is shown on the map here. The pedestrian access uh, from east to west, meaning from across Lakeshore Drive, would occur on a new pedestrian bridge uh, built to land in the park uh, to abut Waldron Drive, as well as McFetridge, while there would be both ve vehicular and pedestrian access coming from the east at those two locations, as well as uh, the underpass at 17th Street. Uh, from the west, the access to the site will occur at Mark Twain Park, as well as Dearborn Park uh, to the south. Uh, the summary of our intake information, I'll ask Andre to speak uh, just in general terms on the background uh, that we will look to, in our formal proposal, we will look to an amendment to the existing plan development that exists across three separate PDs uh, that are represented within the boundaries of the site. 
Uh, thank you, Bob. And I'd also like to thank uh, Alderman uh, Dowell as well as Alderman King and uh, DPD for allowing us to uh, present uh, to the community where we are at with this plan. Um, as Bob mentioned, uh, the um, PD itself, the boundary itself, is uh, does consist of two, uh, actually three current PDs within the boundary. But um, what I'd like to do is actually uh, walk uh, you through uh, basically uh, the components of uh, this development from the ground up. Uh, what you see on your screen here is the grade level uh, existing, uh, showing, of course, uh, the welding yards where it is today, uh, Metra. If we advance to the next slide. We start to get into at least uh, uh, from the bottom at grade of understanding what the components of uh, the uh, the grade level is. So Bob mentioned the connections coming in uh, from McFedrich, uh, which is kind of our primary point of entry from a vehicular standpoint, um, as well as what we're calling Inner Lakeshore Drive, which is kind of the frontage road that links the entire development together. Uh, we've also uh, looked at um, uh, exploring a way to actually enclose the, uh, the maintenance yard and then also allowing for additional service drive to come through, uh, if you will, the heart of the uh, development, at least at grade level. And Bob already explained uh, the CTA extension uh, coming into the site. If we go to the next, next slide, um, we'll go to the next levels up. Um, uh, what we call the podium, which consists of over uh, 3,500 uh, parking spaces, uh, four levels. Uh, this is uh, this podium level piece is really kind of the primary infrastructure piece uh, that's really uh, making up the civic build as we call it today. Next slide. The next slide speaks to uh, the other components sitting on top of the podium. Um, where we're introducing more than uh, or approximately 100 or thank you, approximately 1.5 million square feet of retail and um, breaking down the other pieces of what we're calling the civic build of uh, this does include uh, some residential components that Bob had mentioned, uh, the mid rises, which we actually located uh, on the western edge of the site. We thought that would be a friendlier, if you will, um, uh, scale, uh, at least related to the existing buildings uh, to the west of the site. Uh, and also uh, what we think is really the heart of this development, which is the transit hub, which is what Bob has spoke to. Uh, this not only speaks to uh, our, our new transit, uh, if you will, kind of center for the city, but also is seen as almost a portal building, if you will, kind of connecting uh, the site uh, uh, back uh, from the east going to the west. Uh, we really see this as kind of the key gateway architectural feature that allows residents in the neighborhood to make their way through the site from Mark Twain Park, and of course, bridging over uh, Lakeshore Drive onto Museum Campus, uh, also Soldier Field and the lakefront as a whole. So this component is what we like to call our Civic One or Civic Build Phase One uh, development program. So if we go to the next slides, we start to speak about how these pieces actually uh, are comprised of four different distinct neighborhoods. Uh, we'll get into more detail about these neighborhoods in the presentation, uh, but the four neighborhoods uh, working our way north to south are the neighborhood district, the experiential district, uh, which really speaks again to kind of the, the heart of the site where the transit hub is located, a lifestyle district, and also the entertainment district uh, budding um, uh, McCormick Place to the south. And again, we'll speak in more detail about these components. So if we start to think about the next phase of development, what we like to call the vertical build, uh, we have a series of buildings that are comprised of what we're calling our phase 2A. Uh, on the northern end, we have four buildings uh, that consist of our primarily residential buildings that are, are really the, part, uh, the, the key part of that neighborhood uh, district on the northern end. And then swinging all the way to the southern end, uh, working our way from south to north, we have a hotel uh, that's abutting uh, the northern edge of uh, McCormick Place. Uh, we felt that that was the appropriate location for a hotel to play off the strengths of uh, the convention center and also a commercial mixed use building just to the north of that. So this consists of our, our phase two vertical build. Our, our phase two B of the vertical build uh, uh, brings in 
three additional buildings, commercial and mixed use buildings, uh, just filling in uh, the uh, uh, that piece that's left over from phase 2A. Um, all of the buildings, higher density buildings are located, located on the eastern edge of the site. Uh, we consciously made that move to actually give a maximum distance, if you will, from the neighborhood to the west. But we also felt it was a better way in terms of how we actually start to distribute some of the density on the site itself. So we took an extended look uh, at the land use patterns uh, for not only uh, this part of the city uh, in the South Loop, but also specifically uh, uh, around uh, Grant Park and downtown itself. So if we go to the next slide, uh, you'll see uh, six images making our way uh, from uh, left to right from 1999 all the way to the lower uh, right, um, 2020. Over the past 20 years, there's been a historic evolution, if you will, of uh, the South Loop, as well specifically of Central Station, starting with Jerry Fogelson's uh, vision uh, for this site. Most of us who've been here for the past 20 plus years know that a lot of this development that exists today wasn't in place uh, in 1999. So if you make your way across these uh, images, you start to slowly see the evolution of the development patterns to start to mix in a broad range of densities, but also starts to introduce a higher density, if you will, on the southern edge uh, of uh, Grant Park, which is of course uh, the South Loop. But we also took a look at this, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, kind of from a broader lens, if you will, um, making our way just south of uh, the southern edge of Streeterville, uh, which we start to look at uh, developments that have been developed over time, over the past 20 years, uh, in similar scale, Lakeshore East and City Front uh, Center East, uh, just north of the riverfront, and compared that to One Central. You can see that uh, while the FARs are slightly higher, the development patterns in terms of its height are consistent. And we've also identified a series of other buildings uh, along uh, Grant Park and as well, you know, kind of going toward the lakefront itself. Uh, so the, the thought here was to really see how development patterns have not only transpired over time south of Roosevelt Road, but see how development patterns itself have evolved, if you will, over the past 20 years. And I want to make one note here with Lakeshore East, which did start in 1998, 1999. It has taken almost 20 years for that development uh, to come to fruition, with the last two buildings uh, uh, taking or being erected as we speak now. And the next slide speaks to where we actually did uh, do a further breakdown of identifying uh, select buildings uh, in terms of its scale as it relates to office and residential. To understand how we actually looked at uh, our development from uh, FAR standpoint and also from a similar height standpoint for development that has taken place over the past 20 years. And at least on my end, I'm not sure if the slides are, are advancing. One second, Andre. Thought it might have been my computer, which tends to be the case half the time. Can you see it now, Andre? Yes, thank you. So as I was saying, um, we took it a step further where we actually started to identify uh, individual buildings, uh, not only from an office or a commercial standpoint, uh, but also started to compare uh, from a residential standpoint, uh, identifying buildings that have been either uh, constructed or have been approved uh, through uh, DPD's uh, process for planned development um, that are of similar scale, of a similar height. So. In essence, this slide really uh, suggests that how uh, development patterns are somewhat consistent, if you will, if we look at Chicago downtown as a whole, and really understanding that uh, One Central is part of that larger evolution as Chicago continues to move forward uh, in developing its urban context and urban form. And uh, this is a slide full breakdown, as Bob mentioned. Uh, we are uh, looking at a plan uh, that calls for 22 million square feet of development uh, broken out by use uh, that you can see clearly here uh, as we start to think about, again, the future of the site and programmatically how it would be balanced out uh, over time. This is a mixed use development. Andre, uh, one point I would... Uh just ask you to emphasize is it, it's always useful to look at FAR ratios. And I, I think here you've shown two ways to look at 
density as measured by FAR, but would it be fair to say that one of the distinct differences of one central as compared to a lakeshore east or north of the river is while you have comparable amounts of density, uh, the amount of open space and green space that we have within the 30 plus acres would be much more generous than what exists in those two areas. Yes, and I think uh, you'll see in some other slides that kind of su that's definitely supports that statement. I think also when you think about how we are distributing uh, the density on the site, it does provide for, uh, if you will, kind of a more uh, a balance where we actually, um, as I mentioned, you know, the idea of actually where we're locating density and height, uh, shifting that mostly to the eastern part of the site, but also really being careful of how we actually, you know, think about this in terms of what's sensitive to the neighborhood just to the west. But it is very much uh, comparable uh, and consistent, again, with the development patterns, at least from an FAR standpoint, from a height standpoint, from an urban infill standpoint, as some of the other larger developments have taken place over the past 20 years and are still evolving to this day. Thanks, Andre. Uh, in addition to the work that, that uh, Gensler has done to look at, at urban context and how does one central compare to other development districts uh, from the past and currently within the city, we've also had Gensler do a very in-depth analysis of the development patterns within the neighborhood. Uh, we learned a great amount from this. It, it really is instructing and influencing the master plan in many respects. Uh, we've probably studied every uh, building that's been developed in the neighborhood and its relation to its surroundings. Andre, would you walk through some of these slides and just explain kind of the genesis behind this type of analysis? Yeah, we thought it was important to really take a more detailed look in terms of how the neighborhood actually did evolve. Uh, and we also wanted to understand this in terms of scale and height uh, from a development standpoint. So uh, if you look at the image on the left, which is a section uh, along Indiana um, uh, Avenue, uh, you can see where you know there's a clear transition from uh, the townhomes uh, at uh, the 1300 block of South Indiana and kind of transitioning up in scale from the mid rises uh, at 125 East 13th, uh, all the way up to uh, where NEMA is. So, you know, I think one good thing about not only this analysis, it really kind of speaks to the spirit of Chicago, where density can coexist with a broad range of scale of buildings. Uh, and, you know, of course, this is your neighborhood and you live it, um, but we wanted to at least point this out because there is a, a clear pattern of how development does uh, evolve, but also shows how uh, we can have a broad range of densities that can coexist uh, in a neighborhood in the district, such as uh, uh, the South Loop. And Andre, Next fair, to, fair to say that, uh, go back one slide if you would, Elizabeth. The, the things that stood out to us, you know, this is the most recent development in the South Loop neighborhood, is the height and mass and density relationship between these buildings. The, the tallest residential building today and in the market to the right, 30 feet north of uh, more of a mid-rise building, you know, you've got a four to one relationship of height with, with limited to a 30 foot setback and stepping back in time from there, uh, all the way back to 2003, you know, the relationship of buildings, is it fair to say, Andre, was in very close proximity and with increasing density measured by height over time to the more recent past. Is that a fair way to characterize the development progression in the neighborhood? Yeah, that's an accurate way to, to characterize the, the, the progression. Uh, and again, I think this is uh, not only characteristic of, of the South Loop, but it is consistent very much with development patterns uh, in Chicago, especially as we start to look uh, north and south of the core of our downtowns. So there's a whole series of these studies. We won't go through each one. They're in the deck that's uh, that's been submitted, and there are many more. These are just a couple of the examples that show uh, the history and the development patterns that have occurred throughout the neighborhood, going all the way back to the origins of the master plan for Central Station, where you've got conditions like this townhome, low rise buildings, 60, 80, 90 feet away from much taller buildings is a, is a fairly common uh, a density relationship throughout the neighborhood. 
Yeah, and Bob, if I can point out one thing related to uh, uh, this pr previous slide that was on screen, and you see it uh, throughout the South Loop, uh, especially as you look at the edge of our of, of our site uh, in your neighborhood, of course, is that you do have you know this relationship of you know townhomes uh, and also mid rises, and you start to see higher density, if you will, kind of building back up as you go east, and that's we're following that the the plan that we're actually proposing really kind of follows that development pattern and actually follows that uh, trend, if you will, of actually starting to push the density, you know, toward the east, closer to the lakefront. Again, it's a development pattern. It's not uh, only uh, existing here, but it's throughout uh, uh, Chicago as you make your way, uh, especially further north, where you see a lot of the tall, taller buildings, if you will, push toward the eastern edge, uh, reaching back over toward the lakefront. And so with that, we did a series of diagrams, and uh, these are four concepts that we've been studying uh, for the past year, working with uh, Landmark. Uh, and if you could kind of follow along as we go from uh, concept one through concept four, uh, you can see clearly there's one building that's labeled existing in each of the diagrams. Uh, we started to do a series of studies to understand where density would be located, uh, where uh, it makes sense. So this is a section uh, through uh, the one central site. And the first concept uh, looked at uh, kind of distributing the density on both the eastern and western edge of the site, uh, something that we felt uh, was probably more abrupt than it needed to be in terms of having higher density on the western edge of the site. Uh, the second uh, concept looked at seeing how we could actually step back some of that density, uh, where we still will allow for uh, higher, uh, taller buildings on both edges of the site, on the eastern edge and on the western edge, with some uh, stepping, back in, stepping back at the base. Uh, the third concept in the lower left uh, starts to really aggressively push most of that density toward the eastern edge. And above uh, what we have described as the podium where we have our retail piece, uh, um, where the civic build is, uh, will be a lower scale building. So uh, that distance uh, varies as we go from north to south, uh, uh, anywhere between 200 to, to as high as 275 feet. And where we ended up landing uh, uh, with the current plan is where we're at with concept four, which looks at uh, pushing again, most of that, uh, if not all of the uh, higher density uh, to the eastern edge of the site uh, with some staircasing or stepping back of the uh, civic build where that retail piece would be and also allowing for uh, lower density mid-rise residential development. We felt that this was uh, a, a more friendlier approach from an urban design standpoint, allowing for uh, maximum distance uh, to really respect uh, some of the, the uh, buildings that are along the eastern ed or western edge of the site. And also, again, as I uh, said many times, the idea of kind of being consistent with pushing the higher density toward the eastern edge of our site. And Andre, would it be fair to say uh, of all the uh, issues we've had feedback from within the neighborhood, uh, the original plan really was concept one to look at uh, taller, more vertical development on the eastern and western edge of the site. One of the advantages with that that we saw early on is that would allow for a more rapid pace of development. Uh, but through your work and the work of the team overall, uh, your strong recommendation to be responsive uh, very much to what we heard within the neighborhood and different than the historic development patterns is concept four where you're creating separation of the vertical development uh, by as much as 200, 250, 300 feet in some cases. And while those buildings uh, show taller uh, in order to reach the programmatic estimates that we're after, uh, your recommendation is to concentrate the development east and create that separation of existing buildings to new development on the east edge of the site. Is that, is that a fair statement? This is probably the most significant design issue that we've dealt with over the last year. Right, definitely not only a fair statement, it sums it up uh, very well in terms of really trying to make sure that we are not only uh, uh, respecting what we've heard uh, from the community, but also still try to create, you know, uh, that maximum distance that offers a clear buffer uh, for uh, those existing buildings on the western side of the site, but still allowing for density to take place where we've actually located it toward the eastern edge. And if we go to, to the next slide. 
um, you know, just building on some of the key things, it's kind of more expanded, as Bob says, we have a, said we have a number of studies we, we've done. Uh, this is a series of sections that we've done a lot for each building that's actually adjacent uh, to the uh, to the site, um, uh, ranging from uh, the buildings at uh, 1405 South Prairie, townhome conditions, uh, all the way down to the uh, the uh, 1626 uh, South Prairie building, a more of a mid, if not a high rise, where we're showing these, this condition uh, and how development, particularly as it relates to the location of uh, the higher density or the vertical build and how it relates to these existing buildings uh, to the north of Mark Twain Park. And I believe the next slide actually highlights uh, the conditions going south uh, for those buildings, um, showing again how we're trying to respect as much as possible, uh, uh, pushing those the development to the eastern edge of the site, and also showing how this, the distances, uh, if you will, that relationship between the existing buildings at 1717 South Prairie down to 2001 South Calumet, uh, showing how that uh, the vertical build along with the civic build itself is sitting in context in relationship uh, to those buildings on the western edge of the site. Next slide. So Bob, um, I know we you talked earlier uh, the idea of uh, create talking about connectivity. Uh, one of the things that we wanted uh, wanted to make sure was that we wanted to build on some of the strengths that were in place today, and one of them was Mark Twain Park. Uh, will certainly be maintained and improved as, as a publicly accessible open space. Uh, we understand that this is the neighborhood's park, and we wanted to make sure that this was not only uh, part of the plan, but actually served as a transition, if you will, uh, and a clear access point that allows the neighborhood to make its way uh, from uh, the west across Lakeshore Drive to the amenities uh, on the eastern side of Lakeshore Drive. Of course, today, uh, you know this better than we do, uh, um, to say that the access uh, to lakefront is uh, uh, close to minimal is maybe even an overstatement. Uh, you can see the images here with the 18th Street pedestrian underpass, of course, the pedestrian bridge, which some argue barely makes or passes a ADA code. Uh, then also Roosevelt Road, at least on the northern side, or should say on the south side of Roosevelt Road. It makes for a very very difficult series of stretches if you try to make your way uh, from one side of the site uh, to the lakefront. But on the next slide, uh, the one thing that we did talk about was not only uh, creating that environment uh, that allows Mark Twain Park to continue to be Mark Twain Park and be that neighborhood park, but also that kind of front door that allows you to, to get into the site not only through the transit hub, which is at, at the heart and center of the site, but also uh, a clear way to go through the transit hub and if you will, even around the transit hub to that pedestrian bridge to make your way to the lakefront. Uh, we also uh, have an entry point uh, at uh, Dearborn Park. Um, but the other thing that we wanted to emphasize and uh, the next time we uh, do engage the community, we'll talk a little bit more about this is what we're calling this uh, pedestrian street or the next great pedestrian street potentially for Chicago, which speaks to the entry point uh, coming into the site from McFedrich uh, and a pedestrian, if you will, walkway and, and street uh, that takes you all the way through the site, linking those four neighborhoods or those four districts that we talked about and ultimately connecting uh, to uh, to um, the uh, uh, to the Civic Center to the South McCormick Place. So we think that connectivity is very key. We think that open space as it's itself is important here. Uh, this is fully accessible to the public. We should also mention, and you'll see uh, in the future as we start to develop this great street, that it's going to have a series of outdoor spaces and to create a new public realm that links this development not only to the site, uh, uh, to the uh, existing neighborhood, but also starts to link these four districts that we'll talk about a little bit uh, here in the next few slides. Andre, just two points of clarification on this slide. Uh, Number one, Mark Twain Park is, is privately owned. Uh, that's part of the one central land, but it is park. And in the early studies that were done, there were concepts that were being developed of potentially building in the park. Uh, we've stepped away from that idea, again, to, to really uh, develop out the park as a neighborhood amenity, but also to pull development uh, away from the neighborhood. The other point I just want to be clear on is at the podium level where you see the red line there, uh, when Andre describes that as a great urban street, that is non-vehicular. That's an urban pedestrian zone uh, with a very strong orientation toward uh, open space, green space as an extension 
through the site connecting these four districts, as well as east to west, uh, connecting the neighborhood to Mark Twain Park through the development uh, out across Lakeshore Drive into the park. Uh, and we have a series of studies that are being undertaken uh, to look at how to create a very uh, generous ADA compliant uh, and very much a feature that will link the neighborhood to the lakefront. And just one last point, we really think that this is one of the key uh, features, especially from a public realm standpoint, and also from a pedestrian standpoint, that really can make this a very unique place, not only in Chicago, but one of the more unique ur urban experiences in the country. Neighborhood amenities, uh, we've got a few more points here, and then uh, we'll shift to questions. Uh, one of the dominant questions that we've had uh, over the last couple of years in our various meetings, not just within the neighborhood, but also within the, the lakefront uh, civic and cultural district is what type of amenity set uh, can be brought together at One Central? We, we've got a, a number of unique factors, uh, just the, the sheer number of people uh, that circulate in and around the site, uh, a concentrated dense neighborhood. And as we've learned in our studies with JLL and AECOM, uh, the neighborhood today, by all measures, is uh, significantly underserved uh, with the type of urban amenities that, that are expected of a neighborhood of this density, and uh, especially when you begin to look at the forecasts of how density is going to increase in the neighborhood when you look out over the next 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, by comparison, the analysis that has been done for us by JLL and AECOM points to uh, factors like the, the neighborhood is underserved today by a third to a fourth uh, of the amount of density of urban amenities that are currently available in other neighborhoods, comparable neighborhoods throughout the city. And One Central gives us the opportunity uh, to address that and, and bring the type of ur urban retail dining entertainment in these four districts uh, that will provide community spaces in the experiential district and new attractions as well as neighborhood retail, lifestyle retail, uh, and entertainment uh, at the southern end of the site abutting McCormick Place. And Bob, if I could just make a couple uh, points before I turn it over to you to close. Uh, as we did look at uh, neighborhood from a uh, scale, urban scale standpoint, we also took a very close look at it as well uh, from an amenity standpoint. And um, if we go to the next slide, this gets into some of the, uh, the components of these four districts, um, starting north in the neighborhood district, which is uh, going to be a home to grocery stores, uh, homeware, neighborhood shops. It's really supporting not only the neighborhood itself that will be there in the future, but it's also meant to support uh, the current neighborhood that's there today. Uh, the experiential district, again, we talked about the hub as being kind of the heart of that piece, uh, but it's really meant to be uh, an expansion, if you will, of some of uh, our greatest assets that we do have uh, at Museum Campus. Uh, so we can have a, a unique kind of experience that's brought to One Central, but rep represents the city as a whole. The lifestyle district uh, with components of health and wellness, fitness and uh, brand alley, and then last but not least, the entertainment district, which will be live music and entertainment, you know, again, kind of building off of uh, the strengths, if you will, uh, that are offered at McCormick Place that could actually uh, also include live performances of restaurants and dining. And before I turn it over, Bob, I'd like to make one final point. One of the reasons why uh, Landmark and the team decided to show this slide is one of the, the last slides of the presentation, and Bob could build on this point, is that this is meant to stand alone and have its own identity as a phase one and actually have its own momentum as phase one. There will be a, a place that will be identified and, and certainly I think will be able to stand on its own as a phase one as future phases do evolve. Uh, it's not a criticism of some of the other larger developments that have taken place such as uh, Lakeshore East, but I think uh, what Landmark is proposing here in terms of its phase one creates a place from day one and development will happen over time, over the next 15 to 20 years. So with that, Bob, I'd like to turn it over to you to uh, close this out. Thank you, Andre. I, th I think what you're, what you're getting at is uh, very much a part of what we've learned in our analysis, uh, in particular with JLL and AECOM. We've spent a lot of time looking at uh, urban trends. Where will our neighborhoods, where will our cities be tomorrow? And, and what are the things that really are going to create and drive value within our cities. And it's, it's everything we've talked about 
in this presentation. It's transportation. Uh, it is this type of urban district. Uh, when you look at what's going to drive property values and people to want to live in uh, certain areas throughout cities, uh, a lot of that centers on this type of urban district. We have something totally unique and distinct in Chicago where we've got this type of vibrant urban district, but in a pedestrian oriented manner. It allows us to speak to safety and security. Having an environment like that uh, within the neighborhood uh, that is controlled, uh, it is not vehicular as we said, and there's technology elements that we're working on uh, with our partners uh, to bring the kind of, of uh, urban amenities and technologies that will be demanded in the future in and around neighborhoods. And this slide really tries to highlight what we consider to be some of the important, not all of, but many of the important factors uh, to neighborhoods in the future and to the South Loop neighborhood in particular. Uh, the mobility improvements that come with the transit hub are very significant. It's, it's all spelled out in our transit feasibility analysis, resulting in things like reductions in existing traffic in the neighborhood by as much as 6% or more when we achieve full build out. Uh, greatly improving game day situations. Uh, it's no secret all the complexities of what occurs in the neighborhood in and around major events on the lakefront. Because of the transportation improvements that come through this type of transit hub linking Metra, CTA, the Shy Line, significant reduction in game day traffic and the opportunity to limit and correct, frankly, some of the real uh, problems that exist in the neighborhood on game day. And, that's something we can discuss uh, in future meetings. Uh, the urban district and the amenities that come with that, uh, the amenities uh, are proven, both transit and this type of urban district, this type of retail dining entertainment amenities are proven in Chicago and elsewhere to drive property values. The 2018 to 2023 regional transit strategic plan that was put out by CTA, Metra and Pace uh, speaks about uh, the level of property value that is realized in this close proximity to major transportation nodes can be as much as twice the value of properties that are further removed from transit. So 15% growth in property value is at the low end of what we've identified in existing uh, public policy documents in Chicago and well below what we've seen in our analysis with JLL and AECOM. Uh, some of the other benefits are, you know, plus more than 10 acres of additional open and green space connecting to the lakefront uh, in a very uh, uh, urban, pedestrian friendly manner, very different than the pathway to the lakefront from the neighborhood today. Uh, being able to close and encapsulate, if you will, uh, the metro storage yards, the entire Weldon yard. Uh, and basically that, that entire environment remains on site, but it's, it's uh, framed within the civic build structure. Uh, the last couple of points really relate to the technology improvements uh, that we're working on as a part of One Central. These are uh, unique in Chicago, I believe, and really are about providing the kinds of infrastructure and services that urban residents, uh, office workers, employers, uh, tourists uh, that will come to our cities in the future will demand. And that's very much a part of the infrastructure that's being planned at One Central. So I believe that's our last slide. Uh, we wanted to give you an, an overview of, of how the project has evolved and progressed to this point. Uh, as was said by Alderman Dahl and Cindy at, at the onset, uh, we're in the early stages of the process with the city. Uh, we'll have many more opportunities for engagement uh, within the community, and we look forward to uh, beginning now the formal process of advancing from a concept to a formal proposal to the city. Great. Thank you, Bob. Uh, so we have received a lot of, a lot of questions, uh, both in the Q&A, but also on YouTube. We also received uh, questions in advance of the webinar. A lot of them are duplicative, so we are going to try to answer them, uh, but not duplicate the questions and answers, uh, just in interest of time. We also, some of the questions we received in advance of the webinar were already responded to as part of the um, webinar presentation, so we're not going to duplicate those as well. Um, um, and again, we have our webpage set up 
um, uh, at the city's webpage, but the One Central team has also set up a webpage for, uh, for their project. Uh, the web pages are on this slide. Um, and then if you have additional comments and questions that you want to email after the webinar, uh, we have three email addresses that you can uh, do this uh, if you um, want to think about your question or your comment um, after the webinar. All right, so we're going to start going through some of the questions. Um, we, we did get some questions about uh, providing access to the project's documents as well as um, the community meetings that have been done in the past. So the, the documents, the meeting deck is on our webpage. Um, and we also have the link to the community meeting deck from July, 2019 on the city's webpage. And then uh, Bob, do you wanna explain for the studies that you have identified in this PowerPoint? Those are gonna be on your webpage, correct? That's right. Uh, I, I can't say the exact date, but over the course of the next week, uh, we've organized the various studies that we've done into kind of one comprehensive document that will be available uh, on our website here in the next, no more than the next week. Uh, I'm told there's certain times that we can, we can uh, upload that, uh, that we don't control. So at the next uh, point in time that we can make that available on our website, that's what we intend to do. Okay, great. Uh, we did receive some questions about the affordable housing plans for the proposal as well. And I believe your slide just indicated that you would be, uh, you would be meeting the ARL requirement. Um, Bob, is that accurate? Uh, uh, affordable housing is one of the component parts of our Southside Works program. Uh, we will absolutely meet uh, city ordinance with respect to affordable housing. Uh, we hope to be able to exceed those uh, we anticipate affordable housing will be made available on site uh, and potentially off site as well. Uh, one of the opportunities that we're studying right now is uh, through Southside Works, how we can uh, use the transit connections and begin to work with the city on the ETOD policies uh, that have recently come out and look for opportunity uh, to build affordable housing within neighborhoods uh, tied to our site by transit. So. We'll work with the housing department. We'll work with the city. We will absolutely meet uh, affordable housing requirements as a part of the overall development of One Central. Okay, and then I heard you're planning to exceed it as well. That's our that's our goal. Great. Okay, and then there was a question about how. What are your plans to hire local talent for jobs, including um, planning and contracting? Um, is there a contact person for job opportunities and will the developer support community organizations in any way? And what are the MBE goals for the project? And are you planning any joint ventures with any minority black and brown local developers? So there's a lot in there, but it's all related. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of questions there. I, I think the best <laughs> way for me to address that uh, is again in reference to our Southside Works program. Uh, and a couple of key points that I'll emphasize uh, with respect to Southside Works, and then I'll ask uh, Jim Reynolds to comment as well. Uh, Southside Works is a program that we are uh, evolving. Uh, we're working with a number of, of organizations within the community, uh, the BLC. Uh, we've been working with the Urban League, uh, the Chamber, and other organizations throughout the Southside. Uh, as we've been evolving the, the program and the plans for Southside Works. As I said earlier, uh, Southside Works is a program that, that came about as we evolved our legislation at the state. And so our commitment is uh, to activate the Southside Works program as part of One Central during both construction and the operation phases of the project. Uh, that's important because during construction, we create 19,000 jobs. Uh, during the operations phase, as the future development comes online, we create 70,000 permanent jobs on site. Uh, we think it's important that this program span both to the point of uh, will we be working with what we think of as professional services in addition to construction? Uh, the answer to that question is absolutely. Uh, the work we're doing right now, uh, we have significant participation uh, with minority and, and women-owned business, uh, and that we're just beginning that process. So Southside Works is a program uh, that spans construction to operations, as I said. Uh, we're working right now with the organiza organizations that I mentioned, 
uh, to finalize the goals and the structure of the entire program. Uh, Jim, I would ask you to comment. I, I think it's fair to say uh, much of what we're doing with this program uh, goes beyond certainly what we've seen in Chicago. It, it has many components that are active in the market today, but in many respects, this builds off the work that we've done with AECOM to look at how can this project really be a catalyst to drive economic opportunity on the South side uh, using our investment of private dollars and jobs at One Central, uh, the transit infrastructure that we build to open up the opportunity for jobs to also come to the South side. And that's, again, one of the really important factors of this type of transit infrastructure is what it can mean in terms of bringing employment to the South side beyond One Central. So, Jim, are there any uh, other comments that yeah. you would offer? Yeah, Bob, I would, I would add a, a couple of things, having seen um, projects of this type, not as significant uh, as this and to this magnitude and how they have used or not used uh, Af uh, African uh, minority businesses, particularly black and brown businesses. Uh, what we're really trying to do here on a $3.8 billion project is actually help businesses transform and put themselves in a position that once they do work here, they're able to be different businesses, larger businesses, able to do work for other large projects. I happen to have been on the leadership role of the Obama Center, particularly picking the construction companies. And I was told in that capacity that we couldn't find African-American or minority owned businesses large enough to do a project like that, a construction project like that. It hadn't been done around 400 million. Uh, I was able to work with a couple of minority owned companies and get several to combine to actually be the lead contractors on that museum with a large uh, non-minority contractor working behind them. We're gonna try and, I, and I'm gonna work with Bob who is firmly committed to working with these businesses to do, when you look at a $3.8 billion project, that's a lot of business that will be going around. So it's my expectation that minority owned businesses, particularly black and brown, uh, will, will, will see their construction businesses changed, technology businesses changed, engineering businesses changed. Whatever business that they're doing, we're probably going to uh, add a lot more scale to that. The other thing that I'm very cognizant of, and as is Bob, the largest employer of, of blacks in the city are the blacks. The largest employer of Hispanics in the city are the Hispanics. As we build those businesses out owned by these groups, we're actually going to have a trickle down impact on the folks, the people that work there to transform their lives. In addition, Bob has made a firm commitment that as a part of that uh, civic build and the retail shops uh, that will be located there, they will have minority ownership in some of those. And, and I'll just finish with the fact that when we talk about 19,000 jobs and apprenticeships and internships, we're talking about giving folks that get on that train and come down there to go to work the opportunity to have really solid, well-paying jobs, uh, acquiring life-changing skills that really, really change lives and also change the trajectory of the wealth on the South side. And we do our part toward closing that wealth gap that continues to widen. So Bob, that, that's all I would add to, to, to what you said. Thanks, Jim. I, I think those are, are key points. And I would just, uh, I, I would add to that, uh, Jim, you know from your work with BLC and, and the leadership team at BLC, who's one of the community groups that we're working closely with now that uh, goals are important and we're working to establish the goals that we wanna have uh, as a part of the Southside Works program. But uh, a fundamental part of that program is, as Jim, you were referring to is really about building capacity uh, within the community and providing uh, resources from the one central project, given its size and scale, to provide work, working capital uh, to minority businesses, to provide bonding support, insurance, uh, technical resources and, and assistance, to grow capacity uh, that's sustainable for these businesses over time. And it's one of the things we've learned on these large projects is the goals are important and, and we'll have strong and, and aggressive goals 
uh, within the community uh, for the building of the project. But really what we're hoping to be able to do is demonstrate and measure how we built capacity within the minority business community so that that capacity then can then be applied uh, on opportunities well beyond One Central. Um, thank you. All right. Um, the next question, I think I'll have Alderman Dahl help me answer. I've, I've got some um, questions about a focus group that would be created to help uh, the different residents and constituents um, and, and analyze, help analyze the project and help to be involved in the project as we continue to review it. You know, I think we're still very early in, in the process. We still have some kind of basic questions I think that we need to answer before we start talking about um, focus groups. But Alderman, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, um, as you mentioned, Cindy, this is early in the in the process, and you know my commitment is to making sure that um, the that this project is assessed on its merits. Um, I am not opposed to creating a uh, advisory committee, so to speak. I've done that in the past with other projects, uh, for example, at. Um, McCormick Place with the development of the Marriott and the Wind Trust Arena, um, willing to look at this. Um, but my commitment is that it would not be just one individual on this, but it would be people who represent stakeholder groups or associations or um, people tied to the South Loop community. So I'm open to that idea. I'd like to see this. Um, consider this a little bit after this meeting and willing to come back to the community with a proposal or an advisory committee. Okay, so then thank you, Alderman. Um, there has been a lot of questions about traffic impact and parking impact uh, to the neighborhood and also questions about how the project will affect the property values in the South Loop. So I think these are coming from really neighbors that are impacted directly from this project. Sure. Uh, again, there's there's a lot of questions kind of embedded in in uh, Cindy and what you asked, but uh, in our transit feasibility study, we do a number of things. We we measure the impact of transit and how that will support not just the development. I mean, this is not a transit hub serving one central. This is a transit hub, as as Jim and I talked about, that provides uh, service throughout the entire metro area you know, giving 100,000 residents of the South Side, for instance, access to a job in a normal commuting pattern. So while the transit hub uh, has a great impact uh, on One Central in terms of being able to efficiently bring people to the site, it's not just a, a transportation improvement to serve One Central. It's really a civic improvement first. And yes, it, it, it supports the type of density that we're looking at uh, building at One Central. That then transitions into an, an analysis of traffic. Uh, it's something we've spent a lot of time on uh, with our transportation team, looking at how do these, this type of transportation hub, what will that mean in terms of, of traffic impacts within the neighborhood and within the surrounding area? Uh, one of the things that, that I was surprised by in that analysis is uh, even at our full build out, uh, they are projecting reductions of existing traffic in the neighborhood, again, at our full build out by as much as 6%, which uh, is, is a very interesting statistic. And that is solely the result of the transit improvements and the multimodal uh, service lines that come together at the transit hub. Uh, and, and a lot of that relates to the fact that it, it is multimodal. Uh, because it gives you the ability to move efficiently to all parts of the city, including the Shy Line along the lakefront, up into the River District, uh, without having to put cars on streets. Uh, one of the things that we saw in the traffic analysis is nearly everything uh, that residents of the neighborhood do, uh, with the exception of recreation and going to the park and what have you, requires uh, activity by car. And that's where a lot of the reduction in trips occurs because of transit, as well as the amenities that are brought to One Central, uh, whether those are retail dining, entertainment, what have you. So 
Uh, there's a lot of work that's been done. We, we have more work to do on the, on the transportation analysis and traffic, but all the work that's been done to date has shown very positive results uh, and supportive of public policy centered on uh, transit-oriented development as being an important part of public policy looking to the future. As it relates to property values, uh, that's something that I mentioned earlier that we've studied very carefully. Uh, there's any number of studies in the city. I mentioned one, the 2018 to 2023 Regional uh, Transit Strategic Plan that CTA and Metra and PACE published. You know, that references property values around transit, just around, uh, there is no comparable transit improvement, but speaks to property values, residential and commercial, being as much as twice as high as those properties that are further removed from transit. Uh, there was a 2013 study uh, that we've, we've spent uh, quite a bit of time analyzing done by the Center for Neighborhood Technology. Uh, it talks about similar levels of property value enhancements tied to this type of transit. Uh, the MPC uh, had done a study a while back that talked about, again, uh, transit improvements and the impact of property values being as much as 160% of comparable neighborhoods uh, and commercial districts that are less proximate to this type of transit. When you then also factor in the urban amenities, the retail dining entertainment, uh, that also is proven. And JLL and AECOM, their analysis show this strongly that uh, there's significant value enhancements that come together with this type of urban district. When you tie those two together, uh, we think very comfortably you can talk about a 15 to 20 percent value enhancement uh, to existing residential in the neighborhood uh, by bringing this type of transit and urban district uh, in close proximity to existing residential. Okay, thank you, Bob. And, and just to reiterate, since that was very much uh, your response was heavily um, about the transit hub, I, and there were a lot of questions about the agency's involvement in, in the review of the transit hub. I just wanna clarify for everybody, um, CTA, Metra, and Amtrak have been included in city-led coordination with you, with your team, um, and in some cases have had direct coordination with the development team. Uh, this coordination will continue um, and um, the agencies will continue to review the plans as they are developed by your team. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. Uh, you, you know, we're, we're I'll say we're, we're uh, furthest along with Metra uh, and we've been working closely with Metra now for the better part of two years uh, through a whole series of, I guess what I'll call uh, real estate issues, given that we're building an air rights over Metra, design and engineering, and operations issues. You know, everything we do, every column, every beam, every, as Andre could could uh, explain in great detail, but we won't tonight. Literally everything we do on the site is, is uh, intertwined with Metra, both physically and operationally. And so uh, we've spent a great deal of time and, and I think fair to say made a lot of progress with Metra. Still have a lot of work to do there. Uh, in a similar way, uh, we've been working with CTA uh, on advancing some of the basic uh, transit feasibility analysis to measure out the operational feasibility of bringing CTA service to the site. Those results are very positive in terms of increasing ridership. Uh, and the focus now is really more on the design and engineering aspects of how to build that type of extension uh, to the site. You know, it's, it's several city blocks in an existing rail right of way. Uh, but it still has its own set of engineering and operational issues that we'll continue to work through and, and develop uh, directly with CTA. And, and then there are others, Amtrak, Bob, what have Bob, you. Bob, in, in, in the interest of time, is it possible to shorten your answers? Because there are a lot of questions, a lot of sure. questions I see here. here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Alderman. <laughs> and just to let everyone know, uh, we are gonna stay on till eight uh, to, to try to answer as many of these questions as possible. Um, okay, the next questions are about the public open space and also kind of sustainability uh, themed. Uh, so, you know, uh, bird friendly uh, design, but also lead certification and if the public space um, is gonna be open to the public at all times. 
the short answer is uh, on the public <laughs> space, uh, we, we certainly do uh, view this as public space. Uh, some of, of the areas that uh, Andre went through in the four districts are open air, are, are open, you know, at all times. Uh, certain areas like the, the experiential district is an enclosed space, so would be open during normal operating hours. Uh, but those areas that are, that are part of our public realm, uh, we certainly would anticipate would be open to the public, but also highly secure. Uh, it's one of the advantages that we have uh, by building on an elevated structure is we have means of security that a typical urban district that's uh, vehicular accessible would not have. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, interests like LEED, uh, ADA, uh, the technology safety security elements that we're working on with our uh, technology partners. Uh, th there are many things that are evolving in urban settings, all of which uh, will be a part of One Central. Uh, we're, we're studying some very interesting uh, new ideas in terms of sustainability, uh, how to manage stormwater and other factors like that. I did see a question or heard a question on uh, the impact on uh, birds in flight. It's something we happen to have a lot of experience with. Uh, you know, and it's one of the benefits of how we're beginning to look at mass and density so that we don't have this, you know, sort of virtual wall of buildings. Uh, and there are other technologies that we've used and can be used uh, to deal with issues like that, fritted glass and other things that can be done uh, to mitigate the impacts on, on birds in flight. So th there were a lot of questions in there. That's about as direct as I can be. I, I think I heard seven or eight questions in, in that last one, but hopefully that gives you a sense of what we're studying. Okay, and just so the public is aware too, for publicly accessible space, open space, that's, um, owned privately, the city would require a public access agreement to be um, placed on that open space as part of the, the review. And um, you know, if we get to the point of approval, that that would all have to be uh, coordinated. Sure. Okay, then I'm gonna hand over the questions to Emily. Sure, thank you, Cindy. Um, so we've received a lot of questions about um, sustainability strategies regarding this proposal. Um, what environmental strategies are proposed to be incorporated within this project? Um, are there plans to have LEED certified buildings? Um, can you explain? I can. Uh, we have a partnership with Johnson Controls. They're our technology partner. Technology means uh, we have seven categories of technology. Uh, one is, is uh, what we would generally think of as sustainability. Uh, there's a lot that we're studying there. Uh, I mentioned one example, uh, innovative ways to deal with stormwater management uh, is just one. Uh, on any site of this size and, and impact, obviously stormwater becomes uh, a very important issue. Uh, but we're also studying uh, ways to build an environment uh, that is less uh, dependent on energy, uh, that is less dependent on water consumption. Uh, you know, true sustainability factors. There's, there's been a lot of attention around this, obviously, uh, in urban development over the last 10, 20 years. And we see a shift and a very dynamic shift uh, moving beyond that. There are also technologies, though, that are emerging as we speak that are not common in urban areas today that deal with issues like safety and security. It's, it's probably the one of the issues we spend uh, the greatest amount of time on right now is how can we use urban design uh, married up with technology to create a safe urban environment, uh, you know, in a safe urban neighborhood uh, using technologies that, you know, are not deployed today or certainly weren't deployed uh, as recently as a year or five years ago. Uh, so there, there's a broad subject matter there. Uh, we'll be sharing uh, soon uh, the makeup of the seven component parts of our technology program but technology also deals with issues like sustainability. Uh, and LEED is certainly something that we're evaluating. I, I expect that, uh, you, you know, LEED will be a fundamental part of uh, how we're looking to advance the overall uh, planning and architectural design and operation of these buildings. Okay, thank you. Um, we also received a lot of questions about noise impacts 
um, particularly relating to um, the transit line proposed to the site. You know, can you describe, has there been, uh, have you guys conducted a noise study yet? Has, um, have you evaluated potentially encapsulating the pro proposed transit co connection? Uh, quick answer, I'll, I'll be, that, that's a big subject as well. Uh, I, I think there's two parts to transit uh, with respect to noise. Mm -hmm. uh, one is the existing yard operation, uh, which is a big operation. You, you know, you've got a got an unbelievable amount of, of transit movement through that site every day today. Well, you know, 2020, let's set 2020 aside. But in normal conditions, uh, you know, Metro moves a lot of trains throughout that site. Uh, we have studied noise primarily on site. And one of the real advantages that we see of the civic build is you're basically encapsulating that entire operation. Metra's not moving their yard operation. Uh, we're rebuilding it uh, as part of the whole transit hub. And so we see significant benefits of uh, the civic build in that respect. As it relates to the CTA extension, uh, that, that's a little different. Uh, situation. Obviously, it runs off site. Uh, we have not done as much work on noise with the CTA extension, but it's one of the things that we anticipate spending uh, more engineering time on as we advance our efforts with CTA. Uh, some of the benefits that we see there are uh, as the CTA extension comes into the site, uh, it runs along the base of the civic build and we see opportunities there to mitigate noise. And there will be other ways that we think we can mitigate noise as well not just on the CTA extension, but for the existing freight and Amtrak that run on that uh, grade track today. So that's something we will be studying further as we go forward. Sure, thank you. And then um, we also received quite a few uh, number of questions about construction and construction impacts, uh, particularly you know, relating to some of the existing residents that live in the area and how that may impact them. Um, can you um, describe how construction noise and um, contamination will be monitored as you know a project is constructed. Sure, uh, uh, a couple of answers that that I'll I'll uh, share on that point. Uh, certainly, it's a very large construction uh, effort. I, I can't I, I can't deny that uh, over a period of several years. While it's you know it's a fact that the South Loop neighborhood has has had a fairly constant. Uh, uh, amount of construction underway over the last, you know, several decades. Uh, this is a different type of construction, at least initially, it's, it's more horizontal than it is vertical. One of the advantages that we have uh, that is very disruptive on a lot of big construction sites like this is uh, we're basically building from grade up uh, rather than going in the earth, you know, 40, 60, 80 feet and then building up. Uh, so that eliminates a lot of the noise, dust, disruption that can come in these urban settings. Uh, that doesn't solve it, but it mitigates a lot of uh, the impacts uh, during construction. Uh, and what we're looking to do in the sequencing of construction is get, uh, get the site capped as quickly as we can with structure and then begin to do the work inside of that structure as much as we can. Uh, there's a lot more work we have to do from a construction sequencing standpoint. Uh, you know, the, the fact is the city of Chicago has very stringent ordinance that we have to abide by with respect to construction hours of, of operation and that type of thing. And we'll certainly abide by all those ordinance. Thank you. Um, we also received a couple of programming related questions. Um, well, is there any plans to um, include a, con a casino at One Central? Uh, I, I've been asked that qu question recently. Uh, the best way I can answer that question is that that's a city decision. We, we, we don't have any, uh, y y you know, any involvement or say over where a, a casino is built. Uh, what I'll say in addition to that is there was a request for uh, information issued by the city uh, some number of months ago. Uh, we did review that and we chose not to respond to it. Uh, so that's about as much as I can say on, on casino at this point. Okay. Um, will the project be planned to accommodate high, regional high speed rail? Uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a complicated set of issues. 
We have been approached by organizations that are active with high speed rail in the metro area. Uh, they've shown strong interest in the idea of high speed rail. Uh, one of the things that we have talked about uh, with McCormick Place and others is the ability to connect, uh, the importance of connecting uh, McCormick Place to O'Hare and Midway uh, with more efficient rail service. So uh, while those are things that, that we think have potential, they're not fundamental parts of the transit feasibility study that has been done thus far. We'll look at those, I'm sure, in time. But at this point, a high-speed rail is not a part of the, the transit feasibility study analysis. Another question we received is, will there be any impact on historic buildings, landmarks, and landmark districts in the immediate area? Uh, not, not uh, I'll say not of significance. I mean, there, there are historic buildings in, in, uh, in the neighborhood and in the area, but generally speaking, uh, we don't see significant impacts with respect to historic structures and certainly historic districts. Uh, I think that's as general as a statement as I could make on that. Mm -hmm. And then also, how might this impact the future expansion of McCormick Place Convention Center? Uh, we spend a good amount of time with uh, with McCormick Place leadership uh, as recently as today and last week. Uh, one of the things that we know from our, our business over the last 20, 30 years is how important uh, this type of urban district is to the future of assets like McCormick Place, the museum, Soldier Field. Uh, there's a term that we use in our industry called a walkability score, which measures and evaluates cities uh, and their civic assets based on the, the city experience and the pedestrian experience and a walkable footprint of, of civic assets like McCormick Place. Uh, I would argue one Central is as important to McCormick Place and its future as any other uh, aspect of their business plan going forward. Uh, in part, given the fiscal uh, tax base gain that McCormick Place gets uh, from One Central via the state, but also just the operational advantages and the experience that will be created uh, with our entertainment district, with the experiential district, with the transit amenities. Uh, I, I've made a living building large civic assets. And I would, I would argue that one central, not just for McCormick Place, but really the entire cultural mile and beyond, uh, this type of transportation and urban district amenities is critically important to the future of the type of uh, city and state-owned civic assets. You saw a map earlier. I think we've got, you know, just in the immediate vicinity, more than a dozen major civic assets that drive tourism and connected by Shyline. Uh, you know, we really reach something like 50 million visitors that come to the city. So I would argue this is a vitally important part of McCormick's future as well as the other civic assets. Thank you. And then we also received a few questions um, along the same lines. Is there a need for the proposed amount of development on the site? Is there an actual need for a transportation hub in this area or neighborhood? Um, just uh, from DPD's standpoint, um, we are you know, reviewing the studies that they provided us and we have some questions about some of the assumptions made in the reports provided. Um, and then as Cindy mentioned earlier, we're still, this transit agencies are still evaluating the proposal along with CDOT and we're still evaluating the feasibility of all those connections, but I'm not sure if anyone else on the panel has anything to add. Yeah, thanks, Emily. I mean, I, I, there were concerns in the, in the Q&A about how this will impact uh, other businesses in the loop, mm -hmm. uh, Motor Row, how it will impact, you know, other projects like the 78 and so on. And, and these are all good questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have, we have similar questions. Um, the developer has um, provided a report by JLL uh, with some projections of market um, um, analysis. So I don't know, Bob, you want to um, answer a little bit more to that effect. And, and like I said, you know, you will be posting that 
uh, report online so people will have a chance to review it themselves. But we do still have some questions about it. Understood. It, it's, a, it, it's a very important question for all of us. Uh, and I would, uh, I, I would reference the JLL study, uh, which we spent a lot of time uh, with JLL, but I would also mention AECOM. We, we've really had both firms working with us to evaluate the market potential. And, and we've done several important things. Uh, we've done a, a detailed demand analysis uh, for one central in the program as proposed, the residential, the commercial, the hospitality, uh, and some of the other programmatic components, the retail dining entertainment. That's what led us to the merchandise strategy in the four districts uh, is really the result of the market uh, analysis that's been done. Uh, so we've hit, really had, uh, I think, the two strongest firms uh, in the industry and certainly in Chicago working very closely with us to evaluate the market demand potential. But I also want to mention, not only have we looked at One Central on its own, we've also done a study of uh, the urban trends in uh, Chicago past and looking to the future, including projects like 78, uh, the Michael Reese development. Lincoln Yards, uh, and what will the impacts be in the central loop? Uh, and overwhelmingly, what we've seen is uh, Chicago's future is going to be dependent not on one central, but on all of these projects in order to meet the growth patterns that uh, are forecasted for the city. While we're in a period of a pandemic, and of course, the markets have uh, gone flat and will remain flat for some period of time. But when you look to the urban trends that have defined the central area of Chicago, the central area of Chicago the last 20 years has been the fastest growing central area in the United States. The affordability factors, the transportation infrastructure, all the things that we're talking about on this call, uh, when you look at the trends to the future, uh, tell a very strong story about uh, the need not just for one central, but for all of these projects as they're currently planned and proposed, and I know AECOM's analysis would say that for Chicago to maintain the type of growth it's seen in the past, uh, when it's actually projected to increase in pace, uh, Chicago does not have enough land uh, in development now to support uh, that type of growth. So uh, during a time like this, when the markets uh, have flattened, uh, it, it's harder to understand what the growth dynamics will be in the future. But when you look at the studies that have then been done over uh, a course of time, and we've seen three or four recessionary cycles in the economy, and we build those factors into this type of demand analysis, there's really no question that there is uh, this level of demand and more, not just for one central, but for all of these projects. And this is an, a question, I guess, for CDOT. Um, has there been any thoughts of connecting 18th Street with the transit busway and allow vehicular use of the road under McCormick Place and connecting this to 26th Street Lake Park Avenue for additional ingress and egress to the site? I can take that. Hi, this is Jeff Schreiber with uh, CDOT. And um, just, just to start off with, um, I just want to be clear um, to the, the people listening that um, for all of the transportation proposals that have been discussed so far this evening, um, none of them have, have yet been uh, validated as to their operational or physical feasibility by CDOT or Metra or CTA or Amtrak or the Illinois Department of Transportation. I mean, we've received a lot of information, but there's been no, no validation that, that any of this is, is feasible yet. We're still, you know, studying and asking questions and, and you know, see if, if we get there. Um, as for that specific question about the busway, I think it's important to note that the busway was built exclusively for, for buses. Um, it has two travel lanes in each direction that, are, that can accommodate buses. And it, it was built for McCormick buses serving conventions for McCormick Place, although it could potentially serve transit buses too, with, uh, but it would need to be modified for that. Um, but there's not really any physical way that it could accommodate um, general traffic. It's just not, not built to a standard that, that would allow it would be quickly overwhelmed by general traffic. So it has the capacity it needs to handle buses, but, but nothing other than buses. So I hope that answers that, that question. Thank you, Jeff. 
I think that it's important to uh, let folks know that just like uh, Jeff talked about the review of the transit um, and that they're going to be doing an independent analysis of the transportation recommendations that Landmark is making, that um, your office will be doing similar work as it relates to the market um, and other components uh, that people are hearing Landmark talk about. And I just need you to reiterate that to my constituents. Yes, thank you, Alderman. Yes, um, as part of our review, you know, we, we are reviewing all of the studies that have been pro provided to us and that will be shared with the public. And like I said, we, we, do have, we do have some questions about the assumptions and the projections and, and the impact to the other parts of the city. So absolutely, we will, we will be continuing our review of, of that information um, before we make any kind of determination of the next steps. Emily? Okay, and then I just have a few other questions to wrap things up. Um, we've received a lot of uh, COVID-related questions. Um, do the plans accommodate more space to socially distance as this is the new normal? Yeah, we've we spent a uh, we spent a lot of time on on this issue, uh, and and frankly, we we see new trends uh, emerging in terms of what urban real estate. Uh, will be tomorrow in the services that will be expected. Uh, don't frankly believe that there's a there's a place in America today that really defines what the urban district of tomorrow uh, is going to be. You're going to see a lot of existing real estate that's going to go through major transformation to meet the demands of tomorrow's residents and and uh, employers and tourists. Uh, the advantage that we have is is we're designing to meet the changing demands. Uh, and they're changing rapidly. It's, it's why we moved uh, at this stage on technology, because we know that uh, the, the seven components of technology are going to be defining elements of the urban landscape in this country and beyond this country going forward. And really what we're seeing in that analysis is COVID is really going to accelerate uh, you know, what the urban residence of tomorrow is, what the urban workplace of tomorrow is, what is hospitality. And a big part of that is the, the public realm that we're building as a part of One Central has become even more important uh, as a result of COVID. Uh, you know, there is, not a, there is not a development district that I've seen uh, that has the opportunity to do some of the things that we're doing with this project, not specifically to meet uh, you know, the changing demands of COVID, but to deal with where the trends are gonna take us uh, in this country in, in years ahead. And technology becomes an important part of that. Uh, it's, no, it's not the only part of that, but it's, it's really blending together uh, changing design criteria with technology and changing consumer patterns in terms of how people will live and work and recreate in urban settings. What does transit mean uh, in the future? So COVID you know, has an impact for sure, uh, but it's not just COVID. Uh, we're seeing some dynamic uh, trends at play in, in urban real estate. And you know, I would argue COVID's really accelerating those. Some new, but it's really accelerating those trends. Thank you. So um, we're at eight o'clock, Alderman, uh, and, and we have answered over a hundred questions in the Q and A, and we've answered um, um, many more as well during the presentation and, and this Q and A portion. So uh, we still have some open questions, but um, our plan is to compile those and um, com compile the questions, and then also compile the responses, um, and then we'll share those. Um, you know, on, on a website, um, either DPD's website or the Landmark team's website. Um, a lot of the questions are specific to the Landmark team and their proposal. So we'll have to work together um, in responding to those. Do you have any um, yeah, parting wanna, words? Yes, I wanna close the meeting. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, I wanna thank DPD and Landmark. I also wanna thank 
thank Alderman King, Senator Hunter, Senator Peters, and State Representative Buckner for joining us this evening. Um, I just want to reiterate for my constituents that um, your input and feedback is important as we move forward. No question is uh, inappropriate. Um, you can send your questions to dpd at cityofchicago.org or to my office, which is ward03 at cityofchicago.org. In closing, um, you know, this is a very complex project, but my commitment is to be transparent and fair in the evaluation of the proposal. Um, and again, uh, this is not a done deal. Um, as I've been reading on Facebook, y'all are so hard on me on Facebook. I don't know what I'm gonna do with my constituents, but um, uh, thank you so much for being here this evening and we'll continue this discussion down the road. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Good job, everybody. Bye, city. Thank you.